Because, like, America is in the ass-kicking business. You know that? Like, we are. Like, that, that's what we put on our W-2. That's what we do. And, like, 20 years from now, we're gonna have a military that's like, oh, my God, ISIS called me an infidel. I am not fighting today. Hey, everybody. My next guest is a hilarious comedian, TV pundit, author, and host of the syndicated Fox Across America with Jimmy Failure which airs 12 to 3, Monday through Friday on Fox News Radio. Here he is, ladies and gents, Long Island's own, Jimmy Failure. Jimmy, how hey. are you, my friend? Hey, girl, thanks for having me, man. Uh, <laughs> Long Island's own, that's quite a title. Um, yeah, really man. funny, I, I just, I wanna piggyback off what you said for a second because I just was out in Utah visiting my cousin and this Long Island accent travels in a very specific way. <laughs> and what I mean by that is if you're in Utah and people hear it, every one of them assumes you're in the witness protection program. <laughs> every one of them. I know. I it's like, great. If, if one more person asks me to kill someone for pay, I'm like, I'm just here to see family. I'm going home in like three days. It's cool, but it's good to be here. When I was in uh, North Carolina for a little bit, like you said, everybody assumes, you know, that you're a, a, a mobster, that you're connected. And uh, <laughs> then I, I did like a local acting thing. I I was always playing, you know, mafia guys or strip club owners. <laughs> yeah, it's good time. So well, at least like here's the one thing. At least you were getting paid to pretend you're in the mafia, because if you grew up on Long Island, Everybody I know after three beers pretends they're in the mafia. Yeah. They're, they're not getting paid. They're actually paying for alcohol so they can continue to pretend they're in the mafia. So right. At least you did something productive with it. <laughs> That's true. And, and it, you know, it's it's when you talk about Long Island and, and the comedy scene, which did you come up through the Long Island comedy scene? Like, did you play Govs? No. The- no. Here's the deal, man. I So I grew up in Levittown. I went to Division, which means I've... I've thrown up behind governors more than I've actually performed on stage. <laughs> I probably have the record for throwing up at governors, uh, probably tied with Kevin Downey Jr. If we were going to be fair, uh, but he was at least he was at least working the club. Uh, but right no, I because I grew up there, I never ever wanted to perform there in the beginning because everyone I know was going to show up, and I at least had enough self awareness to know that we're all patently terrible when we start out at stand up. You know, we don't you don't know that because there's a certain level of delusion. Like you have to be a little bit of a sociopath to get into showbiz because that's what propels you through the first two years of performing in front of, a you know, an oil painting, essentially no reaction at all to anything you say. Uh, But you convince yourself it's going great. and You're going to keep going. So I never, though, I had enough self-awareness. I never did gubs until um, I shot a special like four years ago. It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, uh, if yeah. one of you were to click on it tonight, I would get a 10 cent royalty from Jeff Bezos. So take <laughs> off the apron, Jenny Fahler. We are going out, girl. But uh, <laughs> when I was shooting that special, they were awesome. Like they let me come through on like Sundays and Thursdays and just run my stuff. And uh, I uh, actually cool. like, hopefully with any luck, because I'm supposed to shoot an hour for Fox Nation for Fox next year. And I would do the same thing because I'm, you know, I grew up in Levittown. I, I love the club. I mean, I grew up going to the club yeah. um, and I'd love to use it again as like uh, kind of like a hideout because what happens is two things. It's really funny, but, you know, on Long Island, if you walk in and you're like a Fox News radio host, they're kind of happy to see you. They might watch you on Gutfeld, whereas in the city, it's like you're wearing fur. Someone will throw right. ink on you or tackle you or something like that. So I actually... <laughs> Yeah, when I'm on stage at Gotham, I actually tell people I'm just Jeffrey Epstein's brother. And they're like, oh, well, that's way better. At least he didn't say Fox News. Yeah, you, know? <laughs> yeah, you get you get more acceptance out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, and it's interesting that you say that because a lot of a lot of people starting out would want their their friends and support system, you know, to be there to laugh. But like you said, it helps with the delusion that way. This way you, you think you're killing because yeah. they're, yes. they're, they're your friends. <laughs> uh-huh. but, but you kind of just jumped right in the deep end, huh? And you went out and, into the cities and, I, and started doing, I, you know, this is, Don, there's, there's an old adage in boxing where they talk about like, it's, does it doesn't matter what your record is. It's like who you fought, you know, right. you'd be 33 and oh, but if you fought like the little sisters of the poor, that's really the 33 and 0 doesn't carry the same weight as the guy who's 27 and 16. 
you right. know, yeah, and is yeah. barely getting licensed to fight because he has a detached retina. You know, no, <laughs> I am the I ran Barkley of comedy. I fought every bad room on the Lower East Side of New York for like 10 years. Again, with your soul in a fetal position, you are doing spoken word for three people who are only there because there's a neon light in the bathroom that'll help them find a vein. <laughs> but I was like, this is how you get good at this. That's why I love Long Island people, because they're not PC, and that's great. They get in there like, holy shit, a white cabbie, we should play lotto. Because my curse, and I really mean this, and it's so tragic, it's like, I don't want to be famous. I just want to be pretty good at it, you know? Yeah. Because the stuff you do in comedy is going to survive you, you know? So let's say you get really famous, but you suck. You know, <laughs> millions and millions of people for generations to come they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that guy, he sucks. You yeah, know? Right, right, right. But if you don't get famous and you suck, no one cares. They'll never hear about you again. But if you don't get famous and you're good, you might get famous after you die. You know? Right. Yeah, so there I you go. Know. There's always that. A lot of people say, oh, the male sex drive gets weaker with age. It's not true, ladies. Our sex drive stays the same, but our sleep drive gets a lot fucking stronger. <laughs> When I was 29, I used to go to bars and be like, I'm going to bang the hottest girl here if I got to stay out all night. At 39, I'm like, yo, if I could just beat off to her and finish the ice cream in the fridge. Oh. Oh. If you were to give advice to, to uh, uh, somebody just breaking in, I think that's better advice is, is to say, hey, go to where it's hard. Go to where it's, it's oh, not yeah. comfortable. And, and if you could survive those clubs or if, even if you can make those people laugh, um, mm -hmm. you know, and also with the city too, there's so many people, foreigners, like out of town people, tourists, it's, you, you know, you, you get a different, uh, base yeah. than you would get at Long Island, which is all hometown people. Well, yeah, but, but not that being said, this is where a Long Island audience is always going to be the best audience. It's very hard to offend them because they get it. It's a right. blue collar crowd. And, um, they're going to a comedy club to laugh. They're not going to the comedy club to start a movement to take away your job and destroy your family. You know, <laughs> so right. if you were to ask me who the better audience is, it's absolutely Long Island. Um, I just didn't want to start out on Long Island knowing I was, I mean, just terrible at it. So I went into the city. And if I could tell you this really quick, the first time I got on stage was the New York Comedy Club. They used to have in like literally their coat check room. They would have an open mic in like a side room that in a decent club would have been considered a fire escape, but they went full fire hazard. If this place goes up in smoke, everyone's dead because we can squeeze 80 more dollars out of the coat check room if we turn it into an open mic. So right. the first time I performed, I was literally obstructing an insurance policy. Uh, on a Thursday night, Tom Nemec, who's a nice conjuring around forever, Hates me now because I work at Fox, but we correspond. Right. But uh, it, was, it was their open mic where anyone could go up and do anything. And a girl went on before me and dedicated a monologue to her grandmother who had died that day and <laughs> punctuated it, punctuated it by placing a rose on the stool and crying her way off. Oh and then I came, I came charging right up because I had just taken a joke writing class with five minutes of my girlfriend is so fat, you know. How fat is she? <laughs> you know, and it was like it was going nowhere. And I finally, I finally like I had to just concede. I was like, so fat, she can't even fit in the coffin with that girl's grandmother. And then I got booed and yelled at, but some people <laughs> cheered. But it was just death, death. From wow. And that's the yep. first show. That was your introduction to stand up. Yeah. And and, <laughs> and I left. And I left being like, I want, I want to do this. No, I want to do this. It's, <laughs> it's, I, I'm mad. You want to believe that anyone who survived the Titanic never went on another cruise. Right. But comedians are people who uh, would get off the Titanic and book another ship the next day. The <laughs> next day. My wife actually asked me that the other day with a straight face. She was like, how come we never let me pick out the movie? I was like, the same reason we never let the dog drive the car. Not going to end good. That's all I got, guys. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Yeah, there's no stopping the, the heart of a comedian. And, and, you know, like, that's another thing. You know, we're, we're seeing the world now, like, you know, with all this. And you've been talking about this forever, even in, in on your State of the Union, uh, you know, thing on Amazon, your special, that uh, political correctness, social media, all this woke stuff is, is destroying the, the country. That's how it's going to go down. The redneck babies are going to take on ISIS and the hipster babies are going to battle the evil forces of gluten. 
and here you are a, a right wing guy. Um, how does that play out to the reputation? Like, I think a lot of uh, kind of right wing or outspoken right wing comedians are having a, a, a tough time getting bookings and stuff like that. Are you finding any of that? I know you got your own thing cooking with Fox networks and stuff, but yeah. Um, it's two things. I mean, certain venues, you know, like a, if I'm not a big enough name where people can gain anything from protesting me yet. So <laughs> I'm not saying like I could do a college, they'd probably get offended at what I had to say, like violently offended. But I'm not saying like if I got booked, a thousand people would show up to complain. I'm not I'm not there. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, right. So I can play, you know, comedy clubs are fine. And the one thing about me that kind of travels well is I think people have figured out, at least the ones who know me anyway, that like, I don't mean nothing by it, you know? Like right. I do say a lot of horribly offensive things on stage, I guess <laughs> under the current terms. But right. I, think it's your, I think it's your responsibility as a comic, especially in this day and age, to just make sure everybody watching you knows that you're bargaining in good faith. Like you're not like, you know, you might say inflammatory things, you might say crazy things, but you have to tell them like, hey, 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 this is not like a, a speech, not like a stump speech, not like an activist. Right, I'm just right. making jokes about things that go on in society that we all know about. Nobody has to get their feelings hurt because I don't want your feelings to get hurt. You know, right, it's just, right. the whole thing is stupid um, and it sucks that it's come to that. But you do have that responsibility in a way as a comic, because if you want to get laughs, you need to diffuse the threats in the room. So one of the things I do in the city that I like my favorite thing to do is you can walk into a city club and really beat it to the ground and not tell them you're a Fox News uh, host until there's a minute to go in your set. And it's the greatest thing in the world, because at that point, I'm like, hey, 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 you took the money. You laughed at every one of these jokes. Right. So that should kind of change your perception that you shouldn't just have this Pavlovian bell reaction to hating things. But you've been taught to hate things. Because right. that's what's like so reductive about our politics right now is 90% of the people you hate, you'd probably like if you hung out with them because yeah. they like the same stuff. What do you got in the background? A guitar, a shark. People like guitars. People like Jaws. They <laughs> like you. Even if they hated you from your views, you know? Right, And right. like, that's the dumb thing is like, we all have common enemies. Um, it's not like each other. It's not the other political party. Like everybody, to give you an example, hates cancel culture. Nobody likes people who get offended. You're never going to be at a party and go, oh, I can't wait till the guy who gets upset at everything shows up. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Right. Oh, it's going to be great. He'll he'll call the, the taco dip cultural appropriation. He'll say we can't play music from other cultures. Oh, it's going to be great. You know, no one's doing it. <laughs> right, so it's right. Like, the whole point that that's like what we've devolved into is giving power to this like tyranny of the minority, I think is coming. Honestly, I really mean this for the good of the world. I think we're turning a corner. Like, I think we're getting into this phase of like, hey, just shut up and get over it. But it's true. Like, I think all of these things we're trying to do in the name of like political correctness are hurting us as a people. Like, I really feel that way. Like, I read a study the other day that 40% of elementary school children in America are obese, but they're not doing anything about it because they don't know they're obese, which is what happens when you eliminate bullying. <laughs> Think about it, back in the day, every one of those fat kids would have known they were fat. And I think current events have helped us with that because certain situations, you know, there was the little mini revolution in Cuba where you saw yeah. people out in the streets who were starving, what were they doing? They were waving the American flag. Right, you know, right. what's going on in Afghanistan right now reminds, you know, when you see people clinging to a plane, trying to get out of a country, that, hey, it's probably not so bad where we're sitting right now. Right, and right. that's the joke of right now, man, is that America became the rich kid who doesn't understand why everybody is so blown away by his house. Right, you know? right, right. If you have friends <laughs> growing up who had like in... You know, the, remember that basketball video game where you could shoot, literally shoot hoops with the mini basketballs? And right, you know, the right. kid who had like that basketball game, a 90 inch TV, an indoor trampoline, an indoor outdoor pool. And he didn't get why everybody wanted to come over his house, why we wanted to leave behind our two bed, half a bath Levitt to go over to his blown out ranch. Right. You know, yeah. uh, that's who we are as America. We don't have the self-awareness, most people, to know how good we have. 
No, that's that's a great point. And and I know that kid too, by the way. I, I couldn't stand him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I was the beneficiary of a tough love society. I was 300 pounds as a kid, and I did something about it because I knew I was fat. Like I knew I was fat. Every day when I got dropped off at school, the minute I got out of that car, hey you fat fuck, huh? <laughs> How much can you eat today, you fucking animal? Huh? I'd be like, all right, mom, I'll see you at three. <laughs> No, but there seems to be like so much going wrong the, uh, the last few years. It's been nuts. And, uh, you know, and it, it makes you think sometimes with, with, with is it deliberately this bad? Is this like on purpose? Because this guy, this president can't be really be this bad, can he? Uh, the FEMA director is on. Uh, uh, FEMA director Chris Wells, she, she, she's on. And I'm here with uh, with my s senior advisor and uh, boy who knows Louisiana very very well, man. Come on, man. <laughs> do you think we're beyond fixing it, or how no. do we how do we fix it? No, not at all. What I what I think is what I think is ultimately going to happen is like you know you know they they say like necessity is the mother of invention. OK, right now, the big problem we're in is, is most of the leaders are governing for today instead of tomorrow. And what I mean by that is they're making decisions that won't get them in trouble today. Well, look, I guess I should be flattered. People are coming because I'm the nice guy. That's the reason why it's happening, that I'm a decent man or however it's phrased. That, you know, that's why they're coming, because no, Biden's a good guy. There's a, there's a very vicious, omnipotent news cycle because we're all so connected now on the phone that nobody wants to become the eye of the storm today. Right. So they make political decisions that are safe today, but might screw us over tomorrow. And so I'm going to say something outrageous. I have never been particularly poor at calculating how to get things done in the United States Senate. So the best way to get something done if you, if it holds near and dear to you that you uh, um, like to be able to, anyway. And what's ultimately going to happen is we're going to be forced into a situation where everyone has to accept that sometimes you have to make tough decisions. You have to secure your border, not because you're a racist, but because you look at your country like your house. It has a front door. Do you lock the door in your house? Of course you do. You at least shut it. And if you don't at least lock it, you definitely try to keep tabs on who's coming in and out. That's right. not, you know, a question of black or white. It's just a question of smart or stupid. You know, <laughs> we have a lot of decisions right now that like if they're trendy online, politicians get behind them because again, they're good for today, bad for tomorrow. I'll give you an example. A year ago when we were lighting the country on fire, it was very trendy to say defund the police. You know, for far too long, the status quo thinking has been to believe that by putting more police on the street, you're going to have more safety. And that's just wrong. Now, that was good for today. If you were on Twitter and you had a hive minded liberal you know, group of idiots following you. But it was really bad for tomorrow, because if you look at the nationwide spike in crime and murders and the fact that cities that cut police budgets because of that trend are now being forced to fund them. They got there because, again, that hard necessity was the mother of invention. The officers of the United States Capitol Police and the D.C. Metropolitan Police risked their own lives to save the lives of others. They sacrificed so much to defend our nation. These officers are heroes. They realized, oh, yeah, you know, maybe right. the cops aren't so bad compared <laughs> to the criminals, you know, and it <laughs> never should have gotten that far. But it did, because like when you look at our country, I say this all the time, man, we don't have a crime problem. We have a stupid problem. We have people that can fight crime. They're the cops. They're great at it. Uh, we have no statistics that show they're racist and disproportionately killing people of certain colors. In fact, the vast majority of police, you know, municipalities 
a minority majority, meaning they're not even majority white anymore in most of the big cities around the country. So this idea that we had this knee jerk reaction that it was just a bunch of good old boys killing people, it's really lazy. And it actually became, you know, dangerously counterproductive, especially in black communities, because they're affected the most by the spike in crime. Right. So like I said, that was a necessity. And it was a hard necessity. Sadly, people had to die, you know, but that's what's going to change the way we govern is there is a fixable way to do this. You know, you look at a country um, like a family, you have X amount of income, you have Y amount of bills. OK, we have what we want to do. We have what we have to do. And then we look at that X amount of income and we figure out what else we can. do. You right. know, right now because it's very pie in the sky and they're selling government dependency, they just keep printing money. You get, everybody gets a stimulus, everybody gets an unemployment bonus, and believe me, I wanna help people, but what ultimately happens is you disproportionately harm people because the longer you're getting paid from the government, the harder it becomes to get paid by somebody else. I got them $1.9 trillion relief so far. Because every week that goes by that 10 million Americans are getting an enhanced unemployment benefit, you lose another small business that can't afford to staff itself. You know, when they can't keep a McDonald's open 24 hours a day because they're having a hiring problem, imagine what a family owned business is going through, you know? So that's where what sounds empathetic today is ultimately destructive tomorrow. Yeah, it's it's scary times. I feel like the, like in a lot of ways, uh, the, the, the world has just been Turn, at least America's just been turned upside down and uh, the good guys are the bad guys and the bad guys are the good guys. And it, it's, uh, it's just becoming crazy. And it, and it makes you wonder, like, you know, uh, like whatever people think about Trump, do you need a guy like Trump who's not afraid to be unpopular? You can't do that. You can't do that with me. So they're dead as far as I'm concerned. And we've hit the Taliban harder in the last four days than they've been hitting over 10 years. So that's the way it is. Like even if you hated Trump, um, in in positions like president of the United States, your job is to lead the room. It's not to read the room. It's not right. to worry about whether the room's going to be happy with what you did today. It's your job is to do what you think will be better off long term for everybody. You've got to think beyond today. You do need that. We don't have that now. Like when you have a traditional politician, you know, and and Biden's a perfect example because he's been in Washington for forty seven years. Every move they make is a calculated move to make sure they don't get in trouble today. Ladies and gentlemen, they gave me a list here. The first person I was instructed to call on was Kelly O'Donnell of NBC. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions if that's what I'm supposed to do, Nance, whatever you want me to do. I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, just the last question I'll take, and I, I'm really gonna be in trouble. Nobody is governing with like the greater good in mind. And I'll tell you this about Trump. And this is really interesting because I know everybody who knows him. I know everything about him. Um, he really, when he won the gig, when he actually beat Hillary, which he didn't think he was going to do. But when he actually did beat her and pull off the big upset and all of that stuff, he wanted to be able to say, I told you so. So he set out to be a consequentially good president. That while the campaign is over. Our work on this movement is now really just beginning. He wanted to be able to say, like, ah, I told you, I, you know, I get there. What he didn't bargain for, and this was his naivete, maybe, is he didn't understand that there was no world where the people who opposed him were ever going to be capable of granting him that. Right. And we know that's true just based on what he did accomplish pre-pandemic. You know, Trump, they want you to believe, is a white supremacist. America has been through a civil war, world wars, a Great Depression, pandemics, McCarthyism, and now a Trumpist and white nationalist insurrection. But when you think about how he governed, he gave historically black colleges their highest recurring funding endowment ever. Thank you, Mr. President. Congratulations. You know, $75 billion in opportunity zones for low-income black communities. And then when you talk about, you know, the uh, First Step Prison Reform Act, it freed over a quarter of a million nonviolent black drug offenders who were sentenced under the 1994 Biden crime bill. Like he was consequentially better for the black community than any president in the last 50 years. Two months ago, I was in a, in a prison cell and I'm in the White House. That's, <laughs> that's, that's continue to make America great again. <laughs>
cuts, like in theory, and his tax cuts, the Trump tax cuts, made black households the single largest gainer of income by percentage and dollar. And it's like, no one, you've never even heard that. You don't even hear that out of Trump because Trump is not as good of a surrogate for Trump as people like me who understand what went on are. Because right, Trump yeah. likes to talk in generalities. Ah, these guys suck. What a bunch of losers. <laughs> and it's fun, but it doesn't like get the focus onto what he's substantively doing right. Well, we have some of the dumbest leaders in the world. We have losers. We have losers. They're losers. They're just losers. We have very stupid people. We have stupid leadership. How stupid are our leaders? How stupid are these politicians to allow this to happen? How stupid are they? He right. actually was, on paper, a pretty good president. When you think about the things everybody ripped their hair out over for four years, none of them actually mattered. You know, it yeah. was like, Russia was fake and they knew it, you know? Did he get two scoops of ice cream at dinner? I don't know, maybe he did. He he some Trump yeah, Trump. Yeah, he <laughs> I want to live in a country, I do, I want the president to get more scoops. Well, you know, we're the most powerful nation on earth. If our president can't get an extra scoop of ice cream, what are we? Yeah, you right. <laughs> but it was like so many dumb manufactured scandals about what he said, and we never focused on what he did. But looking back now, you realize what he did was so much better than what's being done. Way better, and and they did. They never gave him a chance, whether it was the the, the Democrats as a whole or the mainstream media or whatever, that they, uh, there was scandal after scandal after scandal they threw at him, trying so hard to derail the, the people from really understanding all the good he was doing. And then, um, you know, COVID came along, you know, it, <laughs> it, it helped it helped wipe away all that Trump did. It helped deteriorate it all. But, well, what? Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, go, go ahead. I was just going to say what it did is it was it shifted the focus to the pandemic. And what's interesting about that is, you know, obviously their narrative from March until Election Day was he where people are dying. He's going to get us all killed when in theory, while they were, you know, shit talking the vaccine, you know, that vaccine, not one, but two, but three is what they're now telling you you're a murderer if you don't take. But if Donald Trump tells us I should that we should take it, I'm not taking it. You have the power to get vaccinated. You have the power to help your family and friends get vaccinated. The trust factor is deteriorated with the, with the government, with, with the system. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like you know a lot of people are wondering why do they want us to take this so bad? You know, like, mm -hmm. were they gonna pay? We'll give you a hundred dollars. Yeah. We'll give you free tickets to the Yankee game. We'll, we'll do this. We'll do that. You know? So today I'm calling on all states and local governments to use funding they have received, including from the American rescue plan to give $100 to anyone who gets fully vaccinated. And uh, I haven't been vaccinated yet. It's more of a health thing for me. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cause I, 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 you know, the factor for four in the blood could thicken the blood up. And if you, you know, the clotting, and all that so i'm afraid to get it plus i had it and so i have antibodies built up so I'm, you know but if you have natural immunity you don't need to get it i mean i i mean that's essentially the thinking is the natural immunity has been better than the vaccine itself <laughs> <sighs> yeah but again it's just it's just your choice you know um there are people who are in the targeted group that should probably get it. If you're elderly with underlying health complications, if you are, you know, morbidly obese, you know, like circus fat. Yeah. You should get it. You right, know, right. I'm, I'm kind of fat. Like I don't, I don't actually look fat in like on camera at the moment, but you know, you catch me at the right angle. You know, I got a little yeah, something same, going on. Same, same here. <laughs> yeah, I get it, man. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a, basically a 400 pound man trapped in a 230 pound man's body. That's exactly what it is. Well, trans fats is the biggest lie. You ever heard of trans fats? It's like this mystery fat. They invested like two years ago, they invented it. And basically they just tell you what doesn't have it. Like they give you the scary fat and they just tell you what doesn't have it because it makes shitty products look better. You know, like I'll give you an example, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Everything on the window and the bucket on the chicken itself says zero trans fats. Great. It still has wear a t-shirt and the pool fats. <laughs> you know, can't see my dick anymore, fats. Have a heart attack and die, fats.
but uh, no trans fat. So let's eat that. Before I, I let you go, we do this thing called rapid fire questions. These are just random questions. Um, and then just get, give me the answer. We'll just move on to the, to the next thing. Okay. So oh, believe me, I'll, I'll get this over as quick as I'm kidding. Give it back. <laughs> Who is the funniest comedian of all time? Kevin Meany. I don't care. I don't care. My jokes don't go over. I don't care. Everybody, I don't care. What is your go-to karaoke song? Careless Whisper by George Mike. So I'm never gonna dance again the way I dance with you. <laughs> <laughs> Great one. Uh, what oh, is can the... I jump in? I want to interrupt. I want to amend it. I usually open with every rose has its thorn because you got to condition the room for a ballad. And then you got to come, you get, you know, you, you know, they say in comedy, you don't open with your closer. Right. I usually do have a lead blocker for Careless Whisper. And if I think the room's tight, Love Shack is unstoppable. Everyone loves Love Shack. They'll all jump in and sing along. But yeah. if you were going to ask me if the game was on the line, every rose has its thorn, hands off the Careless Whisper. We average 7.2 yards of carry. You can't stop them. Every rose has its thorn. Yeah, it does. Uh, what is the last thing or person you took a picture of? Ooh, this is pretty good. Uh, it was Cat Tim and Emily Campagno last night at Fox News. Nice. Uh, we were on the set of Gutfeld and we snapped a shot. And uh, it's such, you know, do you remember those Keystone beer commercials where the guy's like a loser, but he starts drinking Keystone and hanging out with supermodels? <laughs> Every picture I take on a panel at Fox News is like two of the most, uh, you know, incredible looking people in the world. And I look like the dork from the Keystone beer commercial. I want to Photoshop a can of Keystone into my hand from now on when I take the panel. My name yeah. is Keith Stone. Keith Stone, you're so smooth. Always. <laughs> Uh, you look good, man. You had the white jacket on. You were rocking, man. Yeah, you know, we got the, the makeup department at Fox and real miracle workers. But let's stay focused. <laughs> um, next one is, who do you love the most? Like in the world? In, in the whole world. Um, I mean, you know, my, my son Lincoln, who's 12, is fantastic. He's the best of the best. And, you know, him and the right thing to say is him and Jenny, but mainly him. You know, Jenny's been around 15 years. She gets it. You know, the bills are paid. Nobody's getting beat up. She's just, you know, she's got a good racket. She ain't going to blow it. <laughs> if you had a time machine, would you go back in time or would you go into the future? Oh, absolutely. Back in time. Because it's just going to get progressively worse now. Because as long as instant gratification keeps getting better, our ability to enjoy things is going to keep getting worse. America Peak is a country the year we put out the Super Bowl shuffle video, 1985, when the Bears were, you know, we were integrated. We had the Run DMC Walk This Way video. So black pop culture, white pop culture. We had football players rapping. The Super Bowl was now a pop culture event. We loved Ronald Reagan. We loved the country. There was no world where you dumped on the country. And technology was such that you just had a little space, you know? We didn't need this. Like, the cell phone is what really destroyed the quality of everyone's life in ways they don't realize. We are the Bears Shuffling Crew. Shuffling on down, doing it for you. What's the best Christmas gift you ever gave? Ooh, ever gave to somebody. Heather Furr got a double heart ring in sixth grade from the Tri-County Flea Market. Yes. Right, you know. I paid some woman like $325 for a ring that was probably worth six. And she, you know the women in the jewelry exchange who used to have like heavy Israeli accents and flirt with you and they had killer perfume and yeah. they tell you how sexy you were and then you just give them everything you had. I got I flirted my way through a $300 purchase that should have cost $6 and gave it to Heather Furrow, but she was over the moon because who was rocking jewelry in sixth grade, you know? <laughs> that is so awesome. There you go. Uh, what's the best movie ever? Ooh, uh, of all time, best movie for me, for my money. Uh, I probably watched more than anything Unforgiven, but as a cab driver, I love Taxi Driver. Early Scorsese, Taxi Driver, King of Comedy. Uh, I mean, I've watched Unforgiven to death, High Plains Drifter to death, um, but my closet favorite movie, I'm not making this up, it's a deep cut, is Three O'Clock Hot. It's an 80s comedy about Buddy Ravel, who is like a wanted felon who's been kicked out of six high schools. 
he winds up going to this new school and a kid who works for the school newspaper has to write a, 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 an interview with him. But they wind up, you know, getting into a misunderstanding and now Buddy Rebel wants to fight Jerry at the flagpole at three o'clock. And I just, it's like pound for pound, it was on HBO a lot. It did the best job of encapsulating what the world felt like in that era with the new tough kid that was like mysterious and everyone was horrified yeah. of. And then all of like the, you know, game of telephone type thing where rumors spread and mythology builds. And I just, I love that movie so much. And I was just on the road visiting a radio station and I found the high school. They filmed it oh, in wow, Ogden, yeah. Utah. I'll send you a picture. And I went to the high school where they filmed it and it was like the highlight of my life I needed. Love that, that is movie. cool. That is a great movie. I love that movie too, and, it, and it's unsung, like you said. Not a lot of people talk about it. Oh, but it bombed! It bombed the boxes. Nobody cared. It was but so it was great. A, it was a great movie. It's it so was. Good. Yeah, you, you could feel for that kid, like when he's looking at the clock and he see the. They kept yes. showing the clock getting closer. Three o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> and if you remember, he pays the thug who's the football player to beat up Buddy Ravel. He robs his own school store, gives Craig three hundred and twenty-five dollars. And then Buddy Ravel punches the guy, breaks his finger, and knocks the guy out. Yeah. <laughs> great. And uh, the final one, if you were in a cop buddy movie, what would your catchphrase be? <laughs> a buddy cop movie? Oh, honestly, it would always be, it would be, chill, it would be chill the fuck out. I would say, yo, yo, chill the fuck out. Because I think that buys you currency with someone who's flipping that, like, you say it to him in a way that you're not yelling at. Right, like, hey, right. hey, hey, I'm being reasonable. Chill the fuck out. And I think that's good for a partner, too, because you don't want the partner who, you know, throws one roundhouse right too many, and now you're going to jail because you were there with him. <laughs> right. or, or vice versa. You don't want the guy attacking you. So I think, I, honestly, I think chill the fuck out. And I that's think a, you could put that on a Chris Tucker, and he'd be like, chill the fuck out, man. Uh, Jimmy, man, thanks so much for, for uh, being on the show and taking the time to talk to me, man. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, tell everybody where they could could find you, follow you, or or catch a show and all that good stuff. Um, my show, if you want to catch it live, uh, is noon to three, Monday through Friday. Um, you can go. It's on 82 radio stations, but wherever you're listening to this from, you can click on the Fox News app and just click listen and stream it. Or if you go to the Fox Across America website, which is foxacrossamerica.com, you can listen live. You can listen to every episode we've ever taped because you can get basically the podcast version of it. Um, and you can always, um, you know, if you're in like the iTunes or Spotify's of the world, do that too. But I always just tell everybody to get the app and click listen because it's just easy. You know, there's a right. set of headphones, you click listen and whatever Fox is broadcasting, you can listen to. Um, and, you know, if you want to watch me, I'm on Gutfeld or Kennedy. I do like a weekly thing with Harris Faulkner. Not to brag, but tomorrow I'm on Fox and Friends first at 445 in the morning, which is a hot one. Nice. That's a real, like, honestly, Don, that is a vote of confidence in me as a human, because most shows would probably assume that as a comic, you're still out from the night before. Right. And they wouldn't <laughs> book you at 445. So the fact that they are makes me think like people take me slightly more serious now as an adult which is encouraging and sad at the same time because I feel like I'm going soft, you know? <laughs> no, you're awesome, man. And, uh, oh, buddy. yeah, dude. And, and I, I love what you're doing. Keep it going. Uh, hopefully we see you at Gubs comedy club one of these days. Yo. All right. Listen, I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to you ball bags because I want to work on my special there. So I'll have to reach out to Jimmy and, you know, yeah. the whole barnyard jamboree and make it happen. The last time I did it, it actually ran through, uh, an intermediary. I had like, it was like Chris Mazzilli and Tom and Genio set it up for me. Uh, Cause I didn't know them. I didn't have a relationship because I never hung out there. Right, and again, right. it wasn't because I, and like, you understand, like I love governor. Amazing. I've been there to see everybody. Like I, when I was a civilian and I wasn't doing comedy, um, I've seen uh, Downey there, obviously, but I've seen uh, Kevin Meany there a few times. Obviously, I've seen Seinfeld there. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyone you can think of on Earth, because everybody plays governors, because it's the great, honestly, it's my favorite, probably East Coast room, period, like up or down the coast, because the crowd's always down. You can't offend them. You can't upset them. Right. Yeah. You know, you can shit all over them and they get it as long as you're making fun of yourself, too. They don't care. And it's a great, great, seriously, a great room. So if nothing else, even if I'm not on stage, I'll, I'll come hang out and throw up back there again, like the old days. Like I, was a high, <laughs> like I was a high school kid at Division just puking after a bleacher party. One way or the other, you'll see me, God dang it. 
Excellent, man. Well, thanks again, uh, Jimmy. I, I appreciate you, man. You're the best. Big hug, Don. You're the man. See you, buddy. <laughs> Take care.